Good morning. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. Let us open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. All right. I'll read this in ESV. Please follow along. I know you may have a little different version from what I have um, of the ESV, but um, please read along if you can. Acts chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord, Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We do ask that you would just pour out your blessings upon us. Lord, we give you our heart. We give you uh, just, the, just the center place of our hearts. Father God, I do ask that you would just come in and just cover us up with the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. Um, Lord, would you sanctify us, set us apart um, during this time that we may be able to see you lifted high. Father, I do ask that you would just anoint us with your Holy Spirit that we may be able to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, did you sleep well? No? Okay. Um, well, uh, we're going through these five sessions. This is our second session. Uh, as Pastor Hannah um, explained to us, uh, the first session was the glory. Um, uh, this session, the second session, we're going to um, talk about the journey. And tonight, we're going to talk about the calling. The fourth session, tomorrow morning, it's going to be the song. The song. And the last session, which is going to be tomorrow night, it's going to be the remaining time. Um, yesterday, we beheld the glory of God. Um, I told you yesterday, as we were beginning, um, I said, um, I held the glory of God. I beheld the glory of God when I was 13 years old, and that made all the difference in my life. Um, gl the glory of God is such a powerful thing that transforms a person's life, and let that, you know, that glory ta will take you, once you behold it, that glory of God will take you to the ends of the earth. It pushes people out, and that's exactly what we're going to examine. Jesus, who actually um, asked us last night, if you really love me, if you see me as the end of all things, if you see me as a final destination of your life, if you want to pursue after my beauty, if this is something that you really want in your life, would you, jo would you join me in that journey to the ends of the earth? And that's why uh, we're going to look at um, uh, this passage this morning um, regarding the topic of, topic of the journey. Um, there are three things that we're going to examine this morning. The three things. Number one, what is the journey? What is the journey? How, how is the journey going to be? Like, what is the journey that we must take? What is this journey that Jesus is trying to take us? All right, number two, um, what are some expected dangers in the journey? What are some expected dangers in the journey? We talked about this yesterday. There's some persecutions, afflictions, and those things. We're going to talk more about that. Number three, um, what is required of me in the journey in order for me to finish up the, you know, finish the race as God, God expects us to finish? So three things. What is the journey? What are some expected dangers in the journey? What is expected of me in that journey? What is the requirement? So number one, let's jump in. Number one, what is the journey that we must take? Let me read uh, verse 22 one more time, all right? Just the first part of it, verse 22a. Uh, I'll read this. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit. And now I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Ephesian elder, saying, farewell. I'm constrained by the Spirit. Now I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me there. I'll probably get, you know, I'll probably get uh, persecuted. I'll probably be afflicted. Um, I'll probably be imprisoned. This might be the last time that I'm going to ever see you, but um, farewell. My loved ones, I'll see you again sometime in the kingdom of God. This is a farewell message. 
Ephesian, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul is giving a goodbye message to the Ephesian elders. The question that I want to ask here is this, as we begin, I just want to ask you this question. What was that driving force that was in Apostle Paul's heart that pushed him towards Jerusalem in spite of the dangers, in spite of the afflictions, in spite of the persecutions that's waiting for him? There are two driving forces. We're going to examine one here, and we're going to, we're going to examine the second one towards the end of the sermon. All right? Number one, that's the first one. Um, I think this, um, the book of Acts is firmly established on the actual foundation that's actually mentioned in Acts chapter 1-8, which is the very beginning of the book, book of Acts. Uh, this entire book of Acts is established on one verse. That is, the very, that, that is the foundation of the entire book of Acts. And what is that foundation? Do you know what that verse is? Acts chapter 1, 8. What is it? Does anyone know? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem, throughout Judea, throughout Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's the one verse that, that sustains the entire book of Acts. That's the main theme that goes throughout Acts. And Apostle Paul, he had that burning in his heart. Because of that, because of the because of that, because of that destination, he was willing to risk his life to go to, 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 to go to the ends of the earth. But you know, um, I actually have a question. You know, it's probably the same question that's that's going through your mind. You're probably thinking, okay, that's good. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to go to the ends of the earth. I want to actually travel too. But what does it mean? What does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit's power? A lot of us have a, you know, just a wrong conception, you know, perception of that. Um, when, when we think about the, being filled with the Holy Spirit's power, we think of like speaking in tongues. We, th- we think about you know, uh, speaking prophecies. Yeah, you know what? That's ex- in fact, that's exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. When the Holy Spirit came upon the people of God, what happened? People stood up and they started to speak in tongues and they started to prophesy, right? isn't it? And we look at that outward experience, experience of people and we say, you know what? Oh, that's the Holy Spirit's power. I want to be filled with that too. I want to speak in tongues. I want to do all that stuff. You know, good. You know, those things are good. Those things are definitely the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But there's, there, there's got to be more than that, you know? Because some of you are thinking, you know, I don't speak in tongues. I don't really know how to prophesy. You know, so therefore I probably don't have the Holy Spirit inside of me. But I think there's something more than that. You know what that is? What really happened 2,000 years ago? What does it really mean? What does it really mean to receive the Holy Spirit's power? You see, there's only one condition that drives you to the ends of the earth. A lot of people, a lot of people say, you know, I've never been to the DTS. I've never been to uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. I've never been discipled. I, you know, I've, I've never been really, you know, I've never been trained as a missionary. I'm not a missionary. I'm not, I'm not going to go to the ends of the earth. But you see, there's only one condition here. It says, only when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witness. One condition. You see that? Just one condition. What does it mean then? What does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit so you can actually live out your life as a witness for Christ until the ends of the earth? What is that one condition? To receive the Holy Spirit's power. What does that mean? I think it means something more fundamental. You know what that is? 2,000 years ago, when the Holy Spirit came upon the people of God, People started to speak in tongues. They started to say prophecies. But I think there's something is missing here. You know what that is? Many times we only look at our outward experience and we say, oh, that's the Holy Spirit's power. But I think there's something more essential. You know what that is? Think about it. When those people stood up 2,000 years ago on the day of the Pentecost, people stood up and they started to speak in tongues and they started to say prophecies. What was the content of those things? What were they talking about? They were saying, they were speaking in tongues, they were saying prophecies, but they were talking, they were they're essentially talking about one thing. You know what that is? A simple truth, but non negotiable truth. The truth is what? Jesus Christ is a Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Until uh, up to that point, they, they, they didn't know who Jesus Christ really was. Until, up to that point, they thought Jesus was, oh, oh Jesus, uh, he's my rabbi, he's my teacher. 
maybe he's someone who came to uh, Israel to save Israel militaristically. Maybe Jesus is someone that's going to bring people and free people up politically. But somehow he got crucified, he died on the cross. Who is he? You know? He resurrected, oh my goodness, he, he was ascended to heaven. People had no idea who Jesus Christ really was. But on the day of the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they became a witness. One condition. You don't believe me, do you? It's like, oh, how could one condition be like, receive the Holy Spirit? To receive the Holy Spirit's power is to become a Christian. You open up your heart. That's the beginning. You open up your heart and say, you know what? I, di- I didn't know who you really were. But now I see it. That's exactly what happened to the people. When the Holy Spirit, came, when the Holy Spirit came upon the people, they began to realize who Jesus Christ was. They started to see, oh my goodness, this is the guy that book of Isaiah was talking about. This is the guy Jeremiah was talking about. This is the man that Ezekiel was talking about. This is the guy that Joel was talking about. Oh my goodness, he is the Messiah. He is, he, he's here to save, for, save our souls and forgive our sins. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will see who Jesus Christ is. And you'll, you'll accept him as your personal Lord, your Lord, and your Savior. And at that instant moment, you become a witness. You know, as we go, we learn the things that we have to learn. But you are fundamentally, you are essentially, you're a witness. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, something, something fundamental happens. The moment you accept Jesus Christ into your life, your Christian, your spiritual DNA changes into witness. So witnessing or evangelizing or doing missions is not something we do. It's who we are. In other words, if you are not sharing the gospel to the people, there's something missing in your life. You got to really start thinking about: Am I really a Christian? If I'm not multiplying, if I'm not sharing the gospel, if I'm not living the life as a witness or a missionary, maybe I gotta maybe re-examine my life. Yeah, you know, I've seen that many times, and I've seen like I'm going to give you two examples. Number one, um, there is a church in Korea called Yongdungpo Chungangpyo Central Church. It, this church, when a youth pastor went there for the first time, um, this church had five youth group students. Five, five youth groups. It's like hundred year old, hundred year old church. But when when the when the youth pastor, a guy, a good friend of mine, when when he went to that church, there were five youth group students, all seniors in high school. And uh, you know, he said, "What well, can we? What can I do with these five five students? So I'm just gonna buy them pizza every day." So that's what he did. So he bought them pizza every day and told the kids to come over to church so we can just pray together. So they did, you know, like, what, what is it? They, they did, did the overnight stays in the church every night. They prayed together. They ate together. They spent time together. But one night something happened. As they were all praying together after eating pizza and being full and sleeping, dozing off, but one night the Holy Spirit came upon all five of them including the pastor. And the amazing thing is, they, they started to go back to, they, they went back to their school and they started to evangelize in their school. After about a year, you know how, how big the church has become? 80 people. After one year, from five to 80. And after three years, it's 350 right now. The amazing thing is, all those 350 people didn't just move horizontally from other churches to this church, but they all became, they're all new believers. They're new converts. They evangelized, they got evangelized in school, and they came to church. But not only that, but there's another example that I want to give you. Um, I was in, um, I think I was in ninth grade. Does, is, is anyone in ninth grade? Okay, good, good. I was, I was, I was as old as you are. Um, I was in ninth grade, and I remember... Um, Carrying the cross, carrying the cross, and I marched all the way, you know, throughout Japan, 3,800 kilometers. Um, yeah, you heard it right. Um, I carried a cross. I walked through Japan, 3,800 3, kilometers. So it started with Okinawa, and it ended in um, Hokkaido, the northern part of Japan. And after that march, which was six months, when I was in ninth grade, I walked around this another island called Shikoku. There are four main, li- main islands in Japan. The northernmost island is called Hokkaido. It's like big, big Hokkaido. 
you know, Sapporo. I'm not talking about the noodles I'm talking about, or beer. And it's, you know, I'm going to talk about that. It's, it's, it's the northernmost island, okay? And there's a Honshu that comes right underneath it. It's a long island that you see in, if you see the map of Japan. That's where Tokyo, Kyoto, Nagoya, Hoka, like Osaka, and those main cities are. And the southern island, southernmost island, is called um, uh, uh, Kyushu, Kyushu. And that's where I grew up. Fukuoka is there. And between Honshu, the long island, the main island, and Kyushu, the southernmost island, um, there is a smaller island that's stuck in between called Shikoku. It's a fourth island. Um, in that island, is that, um, there's um, about 80-some idols located around, around the entire island. So there's like 80-some um, false gods located, placed around the entire island. So it's the, the circumference of the entire island is about 1,000 kilometers. Well, what is that in miles? It's about 650 miles, it's 670 miles, is it? And uh, so entire island is about 1,000 kilometers. So it, take, it, takes, it takes us about, about a month for us to walk around the entire island, about 40 days to walk around the entire island. 40 kilometers per day. So um, I would walk around the entire island with a cross. This is cross, this, the, the cross that we carried is actually pretty similar to the cross that Jesus carried, you know? It's about three meters long, three meters long. It's made out of wood. Um, it's pretty heavy. It's about 40 kg. Uh, what, what is that? 40 kilograms. That's about, um, I would say, about 100-some pounds, right? And is it? Yeah. 40 kilograms, it's about 100 some pounds. No? Yes? Yeah, some, somewhere there. So it's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. The only difference between the cross that I carried and the cross of Jesus is the fact that the cross that I carried, there's a little tire in the back. So we would carry that cross and we walked around throughout Japan, and uh, especially Shikoku Island, uh, we would walk around this entire island, you know, rebuking all the devils and taking all the false gods out, right? So th I'm going to introduce you to the member who walked with me. Um, there's, I didn't walk alone. I was in ninth grade, and there were probably uh, there were, there were about six other people that walked with me. So it's a seven-people team. All right? the, 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 the leader of the team, the leader of the team is a guy named Arthur Holland, Arthur Holland. And um, he's actually a very interesting guy. His uh, father is uh, American, uh, the U.S. Marine. Who actually came to? Who actually went to Japan to help out the Korean War? But he was stationed in Japan, and while he was stationed in Japan, uh, he met a girl who is actually Arthur Holland's mother, who's a who's a daughter of the sushi sushi restaurant, and they got married. That's where Arthur Holland was born, and all, Pastor Arthur Holland he became a missionary later, and uh, he was actually sent out from the U.S. back to Japan to evangelize, and Pastor Arthur Holland is known for um, his um, you know, athletic body, you know. He was, um, he was actually an Olympian. He won the gold medal in the Olympics um, uh, for judo, and he actually won bronze medal in Greco-Roman style wrestling. So this guy's body is ripped. You never, you, you'll never see a guy as ripped as he, as he is. He's, he's Mr. Japan. He does all that bodybuilding. He's Mr. Mr. Japan. If you look at him, his body, there's probably um, zero, zero percent body fat. Is that even possible? I don't know. But it's, a, it's very close to zero percent body fat. Every single muscle you, know, you can ever imagine, it, it's defined. So, you know, you, you, you look at some like, you know, like Brad Pitt or like some some Korean celebrities, you would look at them and say, wow, they got great body, and you, you would think, oh, they should, be in the, they should be a model or something. But if you look at Arthur Holland, you don't think about those things. You don't think of his body as a model figure. You think of his body as someone that should be in the medical book. <laughs> like, if you go to med school, there's like a little human figure, right? There's an outer layer of muscles, the mid core layer of muscles, and there's an inner you know, layer of muscles. Every single layer is developed in his body. That's the guy. And he, he, he's actually the first person that actually started the street evangelism, open-air preaching in Japan, in Shinjuku, Tokyo. And the second, third, and fourth member of the, of the team, the, the cross-march team, was um, former Yakuza members. 
And uh, they're, they're not the business people like how my father was, but these, these guys were gamblers. So they have a lot of tattoos. Like one guy actually have like the dragon that goes from his like neck all the way down to his feet. And there's another guy who's, who has like the, the, the lion paw on his shoulders. The lion, the entire lion goes to the back. And there's another guy who actually um, has the picture of a woman in the back. He, his, he was kind of weird. Uh, but anyway, so those three guys. And the fifth and the sixth member is the, um, we, we, are the guys that we, we would call so-called um, the academics. One guy was a Tokyo University grad. He majored in English, so he was actually serving um, the Arthur Holland Ministries um, as, a, as a secretary. There's another guy who actually was doing a PhD in philosophy um, at Kyushu University, which is the third most pre prestigious university in Japan. He, um, he wanted to prove the existence of God through philosophy, but one day he realized, I, I won't be able, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. That's not worth doing it. I'm just going to carry my cross and follow you. That's how he came along. And the seventh member, a member was me, the, the ninth grader. So seven, seven of us are walking throughout, you know, this Shikoku Island, going around the entire island, right? As we were going around the entire island, we're rebuking all the devils, evil spirits, and there's false gods there, and Arthur Holland would say, go! And we would run up to, to it. The, 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 these stone-made figures are just standing like this. We would, like, draw a mustache and little glasses, and uh, with our high, like, we would highlight the lips and stuff like that, with a pink highlighter. And, um, yeah, we would walk about 40, 40 kilometers per, per day. It would take um, us probably about eight hours to walk the entire distance. So um, we would begin, we would gear up, and we would leave our um, starting point at 9 a.m., and we would walk all the way through 5 p.m. By the time we, got, we get to our, um, that day's um, daily destination, uh, we actually go to the Japanese public bathhouse. Just we got to clean up before you actually do the church revival service at night, right? So just imagine seven of us going into the public bathhouse together. It's not a very interesting picture because, you know, it's a, it's a very, you know, <laughs> just imagine this public bathhouse Japanese owner is just sitting there and he's having a regular boring day. It's like, oh, every day he's saying nothing's, nothing's changing. He's just sitting there collecting money. And just imagine, Arthur Holland takes off his clothes and he walks into the bathhouse. This guy, op like, his eyes are, like, opening up. He's like, oh, my goodness, what is he? He's like, is he a model? Or is he an athlete? He's like, Arthur Holland walks in. And then he looks around, and there's, there goes a dragon. There goes a tiger. There goes the woman. <laughs> You're... And his guys, oh my goodness, this is Yakuza, we've got to call the cops, we've got to call the cops. And he, as he was picking up the phone, there goes the academics, the, the Tokyo University grad and the Kyushu University philosophy. And you know, they got big heads, but they never really go out, so their entire body is so pale and like skinny. <laughs> they walk in there, they're like, oh my god, this is not Yakuza. It's like, what is, what, what's going on? It's like, what, who are they? What is this group? What is a unifying factor in this group? Then she's trying to figure it out. And I walk in. A ninth grader, and he gives up. He's like, "I'm not gonna even try to figure out what this group is." And I walk in. You know, pa Pastor Arthur Holland. Um, his teaching is very simple: the greatest, greatest person, the greatest one in the kingdom of God is the littlest, is the smallest. So you gotta serve the young people first. So I would walk in. I would sit down, and uh, all these people with tattoos, yakuza, and like yeah, Arthur Holland, and all these people, they soap up their towel, and they wash my back for me. And I'm just sitting there, and they come in, just like, Kyodai, uh, like a brother. And he they wash it up, and I'm just sitting there, it's like, and, and then, I look, I look up, the bathhouse owner, his face is like shining, as if it's like, Eureka, like I found out, and I figured it out, you know, I figured out who, you know, it's like, that guy is the boss. And then after the bathhouse, we wash up and we clean ourselves and we actually do the revival meeting in each location where we travel to. And, um, yeah, we go to sleep. Next morning, we wake up and we gear up. We walk again, starting 9 a.m. So we did that for 40 days around the entire island of Shikoku. But one day, something happened. 
as we were walking, seven of us were walking, and Arthur Holland was carrying the cross, and somebody is carrying a little flag, a red flag that says, Hallelujah, I'm a Christian. Hallelujah, I'm a Christian. And that uh, somebody's uh, passing out tracks, you know, Jesus loves you. And one guy is actually carrying the guitar, and he's playing the guitar and singing. There's another guy who's actually holding the microphone, this is a megaphone, he's holding it, and he's like, He goes, yeah, uh, uh, Jesus Christ loves you, Jesus Christ will save you, Jesus Christ is the Lord. He preaches on the street as we go. As we're doing it, so, you know, this entire island is covered with 80-some gods, right? So we're pretty much, if these guys are walking clockwise, we're walking counterclockwise as, we, as, if, as if we're unwinding the curse. So as we're walking around the entire island, we're passing by all these people who's going through the pilgrimage, visiting the 80-some gods there. You know, it's according to the Shintoism, Shinto's uh, belief that if they go around the entire 80-some gods, their wishes come true, or God, they, they, they're going to be able to figure out a truth. They're going to be encounter. They're, they're going to be able to encounter God or something. So these people, all, all these pilgrims, they walk around the entire island, to, and we're walking counterclockwise, facing these people, and we're evangelizing to them. So as we're walking, we we pass by a lot of people, but that day, we saw a Buddhist monk walking on that side of the road. And as we were walking, it was such a dramatic moment. Just imagine, we're walking in slow motion, and everything just became so such a slow motion. And we made an eye contact, and I still remember his feet completely stopped. And as Pastor Arthur Holland, he was carrying the cross, he did this. You know what this is? This means two people go over there and evangelize. <laughs> So two of us actually went across the street and uh, we evangelized. We said two things, you know, just simple two words. This, these are the things that we said. Number one, I, I, went to, like, uh, I went to the Buddhist monk and the first thing I said was, Sir, Jesus Christ loves you. Number two, and he will save you. I didn't try to explain the existence of God or anything. I just said, Jesus Christ loves you and he will save you. Simply that. And guess what? When he heard those words, tears were welling up in his eyes. And he says, I finally found it. And I was like, what? And then he says, this is his um, third time walking around the entire island. He's been doing this for like past three years. Because one day, he, he, apparently he's a famous Buddhist monk. I've, I've seen him on TV. You know, in fact, um, I don't know about, uh, about the U.S., but you know, they, they, they have those haunted house like TV, TV shows. Like, like the t camera staff, the crew members, actually, they walk into this haunted house where it's, everything's really pitch dark, and they, they walk in with a night vision. Everything looks green, and human eyes look like you're shining. You know? And then this Buddhist monk goes in, he goes, he beats up, uh, whatever that's called, the, the bucket, or what, I don't know. <laughs> and then they say, oh, there is a spirit that we have to comfort here. He's been murdered, and he's right here standing with us right now. You know, he used to do that. I've seen him on TV, and that's that guy. And one day, this guy realized there's no God in Buddhism. And he said, God, if you're really out there, why don't you reveal yourself to me? But the only method that he knows how to find God is to go around this entire island. So this is his third time walking around the entire island, and he ran into us. So when I shared about Jesus Christ, the first thing, the first thing he says is, I finally found him. And when we, actually, um, evangel uh, when we actually shared the gospel more in detail, he actually said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe him. So he opened his heart, and he accepted Jesus Christ in into his heart as a personal Lord and Savior. You know, as I told you, um, we, we were walking around the entire island. So right next to us, there's the ocean, right? So as soon as he accepted Jesus Christ into his heart, guess what happened? He had the actual, like, cart full of, like, Buddhist treasures, national treasure worth of, like, um, Buddhist, um, you know, those things, the, those utensils that people use in, in Buddhism, Bu Buddhistic uh, worship. So he actually opened his eyes as soon as he accepted Jesus, Jesus Christ. There's an ocean right next to us. There's, like, waves coming up and stuff like that. And he had this cart full of stuff, and he takes this stuff, he takes the cart, and he throws it into the ocean. And he goes, can I go with you? So he became the eighth member. Just imagine what happened that night when we went to the bathhouse. 
now there is a Buddhist monk walking in with us. They're like, what are these people? And then he's pretty interesting, actually. He actually sees all these spiritual things. And it's pretty scary. That night, my first night with him, um, because I was the youngest, I was riding the very back of the van. Everybody else sits, uh, sits, sits up front. But this, since this guy's a newbie, he actually rode in the back with me. He was sitting right next to us. And, you know, this Shikoku is like a gloomy island. This entire island is filled with idols and false gods and like, a lot of curses. So you're just walking, you're driving through this entire island, and you, you have this Buddhist monk sitting next to you. And he actually sees all these spirits, you know. Like, there's a spirit that we have to comfort here. This is, he's standing right there, you know. So as we're riding up this hill, mountain, that night, after the bathhouse, after the revival meeting, local meet, revival meeting, as we're walk, you know, driving up to this hill, and he was just, just talking casually as if nothing happened. He's like, yeah, there's a few, few of them chasing us right now behind the car. <laughs> I'm like, whoo! <laughs> Next morning, we geared up, right? Pastor Arthur Holland carries a cross. Um, Somebody's passing out tracts, and somebody's carrying the flag. Hallelujah, watashi wa Christian. And we're walking. We started to, to march again the next morning, 9 a.m. But that day, I had a megaphone. I had a microphone. So I was evangelizing. And this Buddhist monk, as he became the eighth member of the team, he was walking with us, but he was looking at me. And I was like, what? Why are you looking at me? And, this is the, he, and he requested, can I try that too? I was like, you became a Christian yesterday. I'm like, I'm not going to give you the mic. You weren't discipled. You didn't get trained. You didn't go to church. You know, you can't, you can't preach. You know, you, of course, you can't evangelize. Just, just stay there. And Pastor Arthur Holland was saying, you know, give him the mic. Let him try. So I was like, oh, okay. And this is how he started to talk. He says, uh-uh. Um, hello, pedestrians. Um, yesterday, uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, that's what he said, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ saved me. Um, I think if you receive him into your life, I think he will save you too. <laughs> you see that? Evangelism. Living a life of witness, living a life of a missionary is not an option. It's who we are. The moment the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and gives us the power to see who Jesus Christ really is, you become a Christian, you become a witness, you become a missionary, you become an evangelist to the ends of the earth. But there's just one more thing that I want, well, I want to examine. If you become a witness, where is the journey that we have to go? What is the journey that we, we, we must take until the end? Uh, we, we must take. The Bible says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witness. One condition, nothing else. You will be my witness. Everything else you learn as you go, as, is, as, is, as it is necessary to you. When you feel the need, you learn it. But without, you know, without actually going, you won't actually learn the need. You, you won't actually realize the needs that you have. So as you go, you learn the need. You pick up the things that you have to learn, but otherwise, you just have to live out your life as a witness, right? But to where? It says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witness from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. You see that? Many of us think, oh, my life has no goals. My life has no destination. What am I living for? Like, why am I existing? But I'm, I'm going to tell you, Christian life has a definite, definite destination. Jesus Christ, said, Jesus Christ never said, you know what, just live your life, a good life, go to church, and you know, after the worship, just have some donuts and coffee and congregate, and uh, maybe next Sunday I'll see you again, and uh, you, know, you just have fellowship, go bowling with your youth group, and go to movies, and you know, go to the food court after, you know, after church service, and you know, just pray sometimes, and you know, after getting some prayers answered, you know, marry a good Christian wife, and have some Christian kids running around in your house, and and then maybe one day you'll die and you'll come to see me. Is that our Christian life? Is that supposed to be our life? I think that's pretty pathetic. That's not us. We just sang a song. There, there's got to be more than that. You know what that is? Jesus says 2,000 years ago, he came and he planted a flag. 
He says, you know what? You run to there. This is the destination. There's a definite destination. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to know who I am. And you will be my witness from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. From to. Then where is ends of the earth? Where is ends of the earth? There's many different ideas about this, um, translations about this, but I'm going to tell you. You know what? Um, you know, because I grew up in the church, I pretty much sense all the paradigm shifts that went throughout the, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the church, um, you know, as the time changed. Well, for example, in the 1980s, uh, in the 1980s, during the Cold War, um, when you, when the missions organization, when mission organizations, when the church talked about the ends of the earth, um, or they used to say it's the places where we cannot go, which is the communist world. Um, Soviet Union back then, and North Korea, or even communist China. Those are the places that we can't go. Therefore, the, the ends of the earth is probably the communist world. But for, something, for, for some reason, in the 90s, um, Soviet Union um, crumbled down, and Berlin Wall crumbled down. China opened up. North Korea, in fact, is slowly opening up too. In the 90s, Gulf War took place, and we hear about the news of, of all these Islamic uh, countries expanding their forces. And the mission, mission organizations and a lot of churches changed their stance when they talked about the ends of the earth. They said, you know what? Maybe the ends of the earth is not the communist countries, but it's probably the Islamic world. But the Y2K came. As we were beginning to, uh, as we were beginning the year 2000, the internet just became part of our lives. The internet just expanded throughout the world. And people are actually saying probably the ends of the earth is the cyberspace. But where is the ends of the earth? Where is the destination of your life? What are you living for? Where is the journey taking us to? I'm just going to share with you, brothers and sisters, there's at least three things that we can get, out, get from this. There's three ways for us to understand what the ends of the earth is, what the, what the journey is about. And I'm going to tell you these three things. Number one, number one, um, please repeat after me. The ends of the earth is, oh, come on, you sound like a bunch of girls. Okay, you guys are girls. No. I hear there's uh, more girls in this church than guys, right? Yeah? No? Well, that's actually a serious problem in Korea right now. The, the uh, girl-to-guy ratio in the Korean church, uh, for every one good Christian man, there's, well, maybe I should say it differently. <laughs> for, every six, for every six good Christian girls, there's one Christian guy. It's six to one. Guys, if you can't find a wife, go to Korea. Six to one ratio. Let's repeat after me, all right? The ends of the earth is it's wherever the gospel hasn't reached. That's the first definition of the ends of the earth. That's the first definition of your journey. That is the first destination of your life. The reason why you exist the journey that you're taking with Jesus Christ because you beheld his glory, he's going to take you to places that the gospel hasn't reached. He's going to take you to the people that the gospel hasn't reached. You know, um, if the gospel hasn't reached a remote place in the U.S., that's the, end of the, uh, that, that's the ends of the earth. You know, if the gospel hasn't reached certain people in your company or in your workplace or in your school or in your, on your campus, that is the ends of the earth. That is the reason why you go to school. That is the reason why you go to work, to share the gospel to the people that needs to hear, hear the gospel through you. You know, um, I, sh I, was br I was briefly sharing this yesterday as I was wrapping up yesterday's sermon. I said, um, for me, discerning the will of God was pretty simple. I didn't have to like really, really like you know, really struggle through trying to figure out what is the will of God? What am I supposed to do? And I didn't have to do that because God's desire is not for us to try to like understand the will of God. God says, know me. 
Come, let us know the Lord. You know what knowing, knowing means according to the Bible? The word to know in the Bible is to experience. In other words, not to know here, not to try to understand him. To know according to the Bible is to become like God. God says, I am perfect, you be perfect. In other words, you think like God because you are like God from that point on. The, 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 the child models after the father. And after a while, the child begins to think like a father. The child begins to feel like the father, right? So many times you don't even have to try to understand the will of God. Many times you begin to act like the father. For me, leaving the U.S., going to China was a very simple problem. I said, God, there's many workers here. There's no workers there. And your, your heart is breaking because of those people that are yet to hear the gospel. Okay, I'll go. Pretty simple, isn't it? Because I knew the sole purpose of my life is to take the gospel to the people that haven't heard the gospel yet. And that's the reason why you go to school. That's the reason why you go to workplace. That's the reason why God, God, why God has allowed those friendships in your life. Number two. Please repeat after me. Actually, don't, don't repeat after me because I'm going to be disappointed. Um, number two, I think there's some geographical meaning to it. Geographical meaning to it. When we talk about the ends of the earth, it's not something vague. It's not something abstract. We're not talking about, okay, maybe someone out there, you know, somewhere out there, if the gospel hasn't reached, I'm going to go there to share the gospel. Yeah, that's good. But I, th I think there's something more, more definite, something more concrete to it. When we talk about the ends of the earth, this is what it means. Think about it. 2,000 years ago, Jesus tells his disciples, Matthew, John, come over here. Just sit down. Don't, don't make any noise. Just be quiet. And Jesus says, his famous sermon, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. From Jerusalem, throughout Judea, throughout Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the disciples answer, Amen. And Jesus says, okay, good, good. And then the disciples probably thought, okay, the Holy Spirit comes, I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. And that day, when the Holy Spirit came, they actually took, took the gospel, and they started to evangelize. Through persecution, the gospel began to spread. And in their mind, they thought, okay, I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. That's, that's exactly what Jesus told me. He, his last wishes were, you know, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's, that's what they thought. They thought in their mind, I'm going to go to the ends of the earth, and then when I go to the easternmost end, there's going to be a cliff, and there's the fall, waterfall, dead end. I'm going to go to the west. I'm going to go to the north. I'm going to go to the south. And then my Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back. But guess what? As they're busy going to the ends of the earth, time passed. History has developed. And the science has improved. And they found that what? The earth is not flat, but it's a shape of a ball. When Jesus says, go to the ends of the earth, and, and if the starting point is Jerusalem, where would the end point be? East, west, south, north, wherever you go, which direction, whichever direction you may take, if your starting point is Jerusalem, every place you go, you share the gospel throughout all Judea, throughout all Samaria, and you come back to Jerusalem. But, you know, just imagine, what if Jesus had told his disciples, the secret. Hey, Peter, I'm just going to tell you a little secret. Nobody knows, but the earth is actually round. <laughs> You're going to come back to Jerusalem. Just imagine what you know. What do you What do you think would have happened? It happened. I think Jesus. I think Jesus' disciples were shrewd enough. They They probably thought, you know what? I'm going to come back here anyways. So why don't we set up a big base here, the, the center, mission center here, and we're going to send out missionaries. That's not the way to do missions. You go there as if this is the dead end of your life. And you don't purchase a return ticket. I'm going to go from cradle to grave. And this is exactly where I'm going to serve. And Jesus, I, I, Jesus manipulated their ignorance. But everywhere you go, you share the gospel. You spread the kingdom of God. You advance the kingdom of God. And you come back to Jerusalem. But if you look at 2,000 years of Christian history, that's exactly what happened. Do you remember? You see, all this gospel message was being preached throughout the world to all four, look, four, four directions. But if you look at the big, 
the major movement of the gospel, it always traveled westward. You realize that? From Jerusalem, where did it go? The west of Jerusalem is where? The Antioch. West of Antioch is where? It was supposed to come to Asia, but someone was calling Peter and uh, Paul in, in the dream. Where? Macedonia, west of Antioch. From Macedonia, where did it go? Paul's last mission? Rome. Where, where's the, where's the west, of, where's west, west, west of Rome? Where is the west of Rome? West, the entire Europe. Where is the, what, what's on the west of Europe? Across the ocean. And America it came here. What happened after America? Went more west. Went to Korea. What's on the west of Korea? It went more west, which is China. And from Beijing, well, the Beijing is taking a lot of form of what the Western churches and Korean churches are. But if you go to the western part of China, there is still a revival going on. You see that? The western part of China, there's a revival. Have you ever experienced a revival? There's a lot of amazing things happening throughout the world right now, but I'm just going to share one. If you go to China and if you share the gospel, this is a sign of the revival. You get in the taxi cab, and you, you know this cab driver on the western part of China, he, he starts driving. He's like, Chinar, where are you going? And I'm, I'm, you sit down, and you, and you tell him, uh, I'm going there. And he was like, okay. He's driving, and then you ask him, the cab driver, you ask him, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? And this, go, this guy goes, I'm like, never. And then you tell him, you know, you know what the communists believe? The communists do not believe, do not believe that there is no God. Communist, communist people, however, they believe there used to be God, but he's dead. He's dead now. But you tell him, sir, I'm going to tell you a little secret. God is still alive. And God loves you so much, he sent me here to tell you how much he loves you. And this guy is driving, and he heard this news. He's like, who is he? I'm like, sir, drive. <laughs> Sign of the revival. There is a fire of revival burning up in the western part of China and in the Middle East. If you go to Iran, really amazing. If you go to, the Iran, if you go to Iran right now, I guarantee you, whether you're Iranians here or there, it's same percentage. Four, uh, one out of four, one out of four, what's the percentage? 25%. One out of four, from my experience, one out of four Iranians that you'll ever meet who are Christians will always tell you a story how he became a Christian, and it's exactly the same story. You know how they became a Christian? Because nobody's preaching the gospel to them. One day they went to sleep, they see Jesus appearing in their dreams, saying, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. One out of four Iranians you'll ever meet, one out of four Iranian Christians you, you'll ever meet became a Christian because Jesus, Jesus Christ appeared in the vision. Sign of revival. That's, that's, that's where the revival, revival fire is burning. And it's making a very fast way back into Jerusalem right now. You see... Where should your attention be then? Where should your interest be? Your interest should be in all the people in America where the gospel hasn't reached. However, your second interest has to be where? Going towards the westward, where the needs are. So when I stand in Korea, I think about China. When I, think, when I stand in China, I think about the Middle East. When I, th when I stand in the Middle East, I think about Jerusalem. That's where the Holy Spirit is moving towards. Why don't you join the program and move with the Holy Spirit? If you really want to join the heart of God, that's exactly where the heart of God is moving towards. At the same time, simultaneously, he has the entire world in, in his heart, but at the same time, there is the way the Holy Spirit travels. I think it's going to be so much, it's going to be so much of a smooth ride if you join, if you go with the stream instead of against the stream. That's why I oppose the idea of a lot of North Koreans or Chinese people from the persecuted churches. I want to go to America. I say, don't come. Your direction is there, not here. You know, brothers and sisters, there's many workers here, isn't it? Too many workers. There are, how many youth pastors are there in this world, in, in, in America right now? Way too many. 
Why do you think the church is split up? Because they have nothing better to do. Because there's too many workers, too many resources. There's too many people who are just full. But there's just lack of workers out there. And there's two, only two kinds of people in this world. People that live in the place of abundance and people that live in the place of lacking. People that live in the place of abundance, they eat too much. That's why they, they worry about obesity. You know, when you worry about obesity, that means you live in a comfortable world. No matter whether you complain about the economy or it doesn't matter. When you begin to worry about obesity, that means you live in a pretty comfortable world. People who eat a lot, they, they worry about their heart attack or obesity or cholesterol levels and those things. That means you live in a pretty comfortable world. But people over there who are, who are living in the place of lack, they worry about famine. They worry about not being able to eat. They worry about not being able to feed their children. They worry about um, malnutrition. They die because there is no food. But this is, not, this is not only so physically, but this is exactly the way it is spiritually. People who are in the spiritual world, the spiritual abundance, place of spiritual abundance, they get fed too much. They know so much. And what do they do? As if people are complaining about the food because they have too much. Oh, this food is, you know, it's too salty. What does that mean? You have too much to complain about. Exactly the same way spiritually too. People who live in the spiritual abundance, guess what they do? They complain about the quality. Oh, the worship is too long. The sound system's messed up. What does that mean? I live in the place of abundance. They eat too much spiritually, they become obese. They eat too much, so they, they you know, their heart doesn't function properly. What happens where, in the place where there's a lack spiritually? There's not a single pastor to share the gospel with people. That's why people die without hearing the gospel. What are you going to do? Where are you going to utilize your knowledge, your youth, and your, 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 your life for? Where are you going to utilize that for? Number three, there's a uh, third meaning of um, the ends of the earth. It's not just the geographic meaning, but I think there's a chronological meaning to it. When Jesus Christ said, you will go to the ends of the, ends of the earth, that's going to be the dead end of your ministry. That's going to be the destination of your entire journey. Jesus meant something chronolo chronologically. You know what that is? In Mark chapter 13, 10, when Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, when would this be? When would the last day come? When would you come back? What does Jesus say to his disciples? When the gospel reaches the ends of the earth, I will come back. You know, there's only one purpose that I live for. There's only one thing that's driving me to the ends of the earth right now. Because at the end of the journey, I know I'll see Jesus Christ face to face. That's the only reason that's pushing me towards that. You know, I love military because I love, like, I, I came from a military background. Um, I love military, especially where even now I go to military bases to preach. It's pretty interesting. I, I love, like, um, I, I love soldiers, you know. It's just, uh, I, I even Korea, like uh, Korea, I often go to military bases to sh share the gospel to the soldiers. But um, just one um, one, um, I guess, experience that I still can, can't forget. That is um, the, the time that I went to this church in the northern part of Seoul uh, to, to preach on Wednesday night. I, I went to this military base. I entered through the military base, you know, giving my personal, like, I, a personal identification card. I, so I walked into the military base, and this person escorted me to the church. So I preached at a military base church. And when I went there, you know, I you know, preached about, I, I really had to think through. I said, what am I supposed to preach about today? You know, there's so many soldiers, and should I just talk about the love of God? Yeah, that's great, but I thought there's something more that, that's got to be shared. I said, God who loves us in the form of Jesus Christ, he's going to return to us. So the battle, that, every battle that we fight, every war that we wage, we're going towards something that is the end of time. And Jesus Christ is coming back on that day, and he will know uh, 
that you, you, you've been used as the agents of justice. Uh, that's the sh message that I shared. And I talked, I talked about Jesus is coming soon, therefore let's wait for his day. I talked about that. And at the end of the night, I, uh, on that Wednesday night service with a bunch of soldiers and a bunch of like, people in uniform, uh, we start to sing a song called, uh, in, in Korean, 주님 다시 오실 때까지. You know that song? And um, that's a song that we sang together. You know, until the Lord comes back, I will, I will walk this path, narrow road, narrow gate. I'm going to walk, I'm going to carry my cross. I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. And Jesus can come back on that day. I'll know that he's the Lord of Lords. That's, that's how the lyrics go. We, we, yeah, we, we, we were singing that song so earnestly. Um, all the soldiers are just singing. Right? And there was one guy in suits. He's a, he was wearing civilian clothes. And I was thinking, who is he? He's an older man. He was sitting there and he's, you know, bawling. This guy is crying, like mucus coming out. <laughs> he's like, he's like slamming on his pew and he's like crying. He's crying, like, crying out his heart. I was thinking, what's wrong with him? I was just watching him, right? After the worship, after service, I'm standing outside the church, and I'm sending all the, greeting all the soldiers, and I'm sending them back to the barracks, and giving them choco pie, and they shake their hand, and they give them choco pie, and shake their hands, and send them back to the barracks, right? As I'm doing that, this man, this older gentleman in suits, he came up to me, and he held my hand. And I said, sir, what's wrong? What did I do? And this, this guy goes, I am the general of, uh, I'm, I'm the general of this base. He's a, he's, a, he's a three star general in the army. And I was like, oh, okay. He goes, let's go, let's go to my house. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to have a little conversation with you over a cup of coffee. I was like, okay. So I went to his house, the general's, uh, the, the general's house. You know, me coming from a military, military school background, and in the presence, in the presence of the general, I was terrified. I was shaking, I was like, you know, drinking, trying to sip my coffee. But, you know, I had to actually ask him, sir, and let me just ask you one question. I said to him, why were you crying so much like that? What made you cry like that? You, know, you weren't just crying, you weren't, you weren't just singing, but why, what made you cry so much? And this is what he said. I still remember to, till this day what he, what, what he shared with me. He said, you know, I was um, deployed to Iraq for a year, this past year. And every morning, as I came out from the tent that I was sleeping in the middle of the desert, I came out of my tent, and I was facing Jerusalem as I was singing this song, until Jesus returns. Until Jesus returns. As, I, as I'm singing this song, facing Jerusalem, every morning out of my tent in the middle of the desert, I cried. That's what the general says. You know what he means? At that moment, it, it struck me. Let me tell you what he means. This is what he means. It means generals, they actually know the truth. Honestly, from, from the deepest honest, honesty that they have, they will admit that the battle that they're fighting is not 100% just. There's a flaw in this battle. There's a flaw in this warfare. There is a flaw in the motivation why they're fighting the battle, why the politicians are sending them out to the, to the, to the battlefield. And every politician actually knows that. When they're dead honest before God, they know. Everybody knows in their heart, deep inside their heart, they know. You know what they know? I've made these promises to the people. I said, I'm going um, to execute such and such political plans and all that stuff. But even if everything goes well, 100% successful, there will still be social problems. All the economy problems will not be resolved. There will still be hatred between races. Not, none of these will, be, will ever be resolved completely. Every, all, all the politicians know that. How about all the doctors? Even the doctors know. Even if I bring forth like every single thing that I know about the medicine, and even if I, or, even if I am 100% successful in applying those things, that knowledge to the people, and treating my patients, there will still be so many more illnesses that I don't know about that I won't be able to fix. From every single person's lips, out of their honesty, what do you think is one confession that should be made? You know what that is? Lord Jesus, come. Because on the day that Jesus returns, that's the only day that the evil, that the, that the evil and death will forever 
be abolished. That's the only day that you will see Jesus Christ face to face and you will know him as you're known. Like every Bible study you do, it's a good thing. You know, you do your Bible studies, study your, study your Bible and, you know, try to know, know the Lord. That's a good thing, but do that in the perspective. But this is not the ultimate, but there's something ultimate coming to you. Because every time you try to understand God, or try to read the Bible, try to study the Bible, try to understand God's theology and everything, even if you do that, that is still a glimpse of what's coming. On that day he comes, every single mystery will evaporate and you will see him face to face. Every illness, on that day, you will be healed. That day, you will be able to play the music that you never thought that you would be able to play. On that day, you'll resurrect into your new bodies. Just think about it. We live five senses, right? Sight, hearing, uh, taste, touch. What is it? Smell, smell. So five senses, and with these five senses, we try to maximize the experience of these five senses. That's why we go through life. Right? We try to, exp- we try to uh, maximize the pleasures that we can feel through these five senses. That's what life is. But imagine, what if there's a sixth sense? Your life's going to be tremendously different. You'll begin to feel something that you've never, fe- you, you, you've never been able to feel before. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to do something that you've, you, you, weren't able, you, you, weren't ever, you, will, you were never been able to do before. But you know what John Calvin says? A very famous theologian, John Calvin, he actually says, on the day that Jesus returns, when we say our bodies can be glorified, you know what that means? On the day that Jesus returns, when our bodies, our physical flesh, is glorified, that means more than 1,000 senses in our body will wake up. Just imagine why. Compared to that day, us now, will look like a cucumber. <laughs> you know that? How could you live another day without yearning for Jesus' return? That's the day that the desert's going to turn into a garden. That's the day there's going to be a spring. There's a spring, there's a water springing up in the middle of the desert. That's the day that all the enemies will, turn, will become our friends. That's the day that we'll see death and sin no more. And when does that happen? When the gospel reaches the ends of the earth, he will come back. That's the reason why you live another day. You see, um, as, a, as a missionary, I live for that. You know, as a missionary, a lot of people, you know, have this preconceived notion that missionaries are like working for the one lost soul. Yeah, they, you know, that's my secondary mission. My secondary, uh, reason, my, the secondary reason why I live my life is to save the one lost soul. But there's a primary reason why I do the missions work. You know what that is? To take the gospel to the ends of the earth, from this person to the other person, another person, another person. So let the gospel flow to the ends of the earth so that Jesus can come back and he will save the universe and he can renew the universe. So when you actually go out to the wilderness, I love, the wilderness. I love deserts. I love the wilderness. When you actually go out to the wilderness, you know, you, you just pause and you begin to listen to the voice that's crying out in the wilderness. Every time I go out to the wilderness, I hear this voice, voice out in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. I've always thought for the longest time that voice is about a lonely voice of an evangelist living in this world like a wilderness. But you know what? Until you actually go out to the desert, you will never be able to uh, really hear this kind of voice. When you actually go out to the wilderness, you'll be able to hear it. If you pause one second, if you really go out there, you know, sit, sit there out in the desert, just sit there for hours, and you will begin to hear that voice. You know what that is? It's the wilderness itself crying out to you. Please go. Please go to the ends of the earth so that our Lord, our Creator, will come back as soon as possible. So even I, desert, can blossom a flower. So when I, tra- when I live the life of a missionary, I don't live just for the one lost. Well, yeah, that's good. That's precious. That's, that's good, you know? But there's something greater. You know what that is? No matter what, 
for any means possible, I'm going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth so Jesus can return and he's going to build the new heavens and the new earth. And until that day comes, I'm not going to rest. So that's the journey. That's the purpose of your life. Jerusalem, anyone who hasn't heard of the gospel or anywhere that the gospel hasn't reached, or thirdly, taking the gospel to the end so that Jesus can come back and he's going to unleash his kingdom. And what a great reason for us to live for, isn't it? Yes? No? You disagree? Yeah? Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, I still have a little more time. Number two. So what, is, what, are the expected, what are the expected dangers that we, uh, we have in this journey? Uh, please read verse 22 to 23 together. With loud voice, I have a feeling that you will not read this in a loud voice, but uh, it doesn't matter what kind of versions the people, uh, people have. Let's read verse 22 and verse 23 together. One voice. Ready? Go. Amen. Apostle Paul actually tells us, you know, this is the journey that I'm taking, but at the end of the journey, uh, during the journey, during the journey, there are some expected dangers. In, in, in Apostle Paul's case, he says there's going to be persecutions, there's going to be afflictions, there's going to be imprisonment waiting for me. But I have to go, because this is the life that I wanted. You know, I said this yesterday, last night, but I cannot ever say this enough. I can never say this enough. Um, in our Christian lives, if you truly try to live your life as a witness, as an evangelist, as a missionary, you will, face, you will face persecutions. Let me actually say this in other words. If you don't have persecutions, if you, feel, if you never really experience any resistance from people, if you never really experience any kind of friction between the, pe between the world and yourself as a, as a Christian, there's, gonna pro there, there, there's a problem. Maybe you're not living your life as a Christian. When you feel the persecution, when you feel that friction between the world and you, only then you'll know that you're actually living out your Christian life. Because the world and the kingdom of God will always have to collide, will always have to clash, and we live in that friction, the clashing point. And if your life is not defined by that kind, of, that kind of clashing point, if your life is not defined by such uh, frictions and persecutions, afflictions, or imprisonment, or loneliness, and the sacrifice that you have to make in order to pursue after the Lord, there's something wrong with your life. Maybe God has allowed us this, uh, this opportunity for us to get together like this, for us to really re-examine our lives. Am I really living my life, taking the stance, the biblical stance, and living our life? My life, as a person, as a man and a woman of God, if there is no persecution, I want you to really re-examine my life. Am I really functioning? Am I, living, living, uh, am I really living out my life day and, uh, day and night according to my Christian values? Because those Christian values will clash with the world. People have a big party. That day, I made a stance. I made a stance. I will not participate. But I will not antagonize my friends either. It's a fine line. So I said, I volunteer as a designated driver. And while you guys are partying in there, I'll stay outside. I'll drink Coke. And not, never out of a cup because I have to, I want people to see that I'm not drinking something mysterious. But I'm going to drink it straight out of the can or straight out of the Coca-Cola bottle so people know that this is Coca-Cola. So I'm sitting outside as a designated driver until the party's over. When my friends came, I wanted to keep them safe. I wanted to drive them home safely. Small things like that, you're making sacrifices. Small things like that, you're making a stance. Because when you do not make a stance, you will fall for anything. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you today, when you try to live your life as a Christian, you will receive resistance. Just think about it, even geographically speaking. When you say, I'm going to go to China as a missionary, I'm going to go to westward, guess what's waiting for you on the if you go westward? Leaving the U.S., 
go, go, go into China. The moment you arrive in China, going towards the west where the gospel is traveling, guess what's waiting for you? The moment you, the moment you arrive in China, there's communism waiting for you. When you go throughout China, when you go westward, in the western part of China, there's Buddhism. The southern part of China, there's Dalai Lama waiting for you. Lama, Lama Buddhism. So when you leave that Islamic region of western part of China, you go into Central, Central Asia, what's waiting for you? Another Islam. You, you go through Central Asia, you go into the Middle East, what's waiting for you? Islam. When you say, hooray, I, go, I finally went through the Middle East, I'm finally in Jerusalem, what's waiting for you? Islam. And in Ju Judaism. There's going to be bloodshedding that's going to be, that's going to be held along the way. I, I've witnessed the, the, the mission, uh, God's torch of missions leaving the U.S. I'm so sorry for saying this. Leaving the U.S. and it was moved to Korea and to China when the war began in Afghanistan and Iraq. If you're a, um, if you're a Caucasian American, it's going to be so much more difficult for you to be able to travel into the Middle East. Even if that person says, you know, I want to go to, the Amer I want to, go to Afghanistan, I want, to, I want to share the gospel, Afghanistan government says, don't come. Like, let's say you're like white American, you say, I'm, I'm, going, to go, I'm going to go to Iran, I'm going to share the gospel. Guess what? The Iranian government will say, don't come. They, they, won't just, they, they simply won't give you a visa. But you know what? Our skin color is different. That's the day God says, you know what? I'm going to move. They've done a good job taking the gospel for the last 2,000 years all the way up to here. Now it's your turn. The gospel has come to us. Now it's our job to take the gospel the rest of the way. Up till, uh, up till now, you say, oh, great, it's our turn. But you know what? You, let, me, let, let me define that. All right? let, me, let me tell you what, what that entails. You know what that means? This is the time. The time has come that your blood is going to be shed. The time has come your time is going to be spent. The time has come. You have to kneel. The time has come. You have to make sacrifices. Unless you do that, the, the remaining one-third of the way will not be completed. And Jesus', is, Jesus second coming will be delayed. If you divide up the world into three parts, um, the one-third of, one of the way was probably going from Jerusalem, coming to America with the gospel, how long did it take? 1,800 years. From travel, to travel from America, for the gospel to travel to another one third of the way, which is to China and Korea, how long did it take? 200 years. It's becoming shorter and shorter. And there's one third of the way left from China back to Jerusalem. Unless we go, unless we do something about it, unless our blood shed, unless our money spent, unless we sacrifice our time and youth, the remaining one-third of the way will not be completed. Why do you think God has placed you, you know, somehow connected to this world mission that's going on in this world right now? It's your turn. It's your turn. There's a lot of things going on, and, um, you know, if you were persecuted, you will know, you know you're, you're worthy you, you've been counted worthy for the kingdom of God. You know, one thing that I do um, long for is, um, uh, although I try to avoid as much because there is so much more work to do, but in, in the, in the, as, a, as a heart of a missionary, I long for persecution. You know why? Because only then you'll know that you've, have, you've been counted worthy for the kingdom of God. Number three, then what is the driving force? How do we, what is the driving force that's going to take us back into, the, back into Jerusalem, making the final completion of the journey? What is that thing that's required of us? Number three, all right? Let's read verse 24. Lastly, let's read verse 24 together. Ready? Go. Amen. What is the journey that we must take? 
as a witness, we're going to the ends of the earth. And I already told you what those ends of the earth means. Number two, um, in that journey, there's persecutions, afflictions, sacrifice, a lot of bloodshedding, a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice are uh, required of us. But number three, what kind of heart, what kind of heart, what, is the, what kind of mindset should we have in order to complete the journey? And let me summarize verse 24. And verse 24, if I, if I were to summarize, it could be summarized in one word. One oneness. Be a man and a woman of one thing. Unless you become a man and a woman of one thing, you won't be able to finish that journey. If your heart's already scattered, and if you're interested in many things, if you're already serving two masters, you won't be able to finish the journey. You know, um, I know there's a lot of people who have different opinions about Billy Graham, but uh, there's one guy that I do respect. That's, that's Billy Graham. And, uh, you know, Billy Graham, uh, his public ministry was very well known, but his personal life, nobody really knows about his personal life. But I know a guy, Robert Coleman, who was my uh, uh, advisor uh, when I was at Trinity. And it, Robert Coleman and uh, Billy Graham were very, very good friends. And I actually had to ask uh, Dr. Robert Coleman uh, how Billy Graham was, because that, that's one guy that I respect the most. And I asked uh, Dr. Coleman, I said, Dr. Coleman, I just, I just want to ask you, what was so special, so unique about Billy Graham that he became such a powerful instrument of God throughout this generation? And I still remember to this day what Dr. Coleman shared with me that day. He said, you know, Billy is really not much different from other people. I was like, what? And Dr. Coleman said this, when Billy started his ministry, there were many like him. There are so many people that's exactly like him. But Billy is the one, is the only one that finished the race. That has made all the difference. You know what, you know what that is? He was just a person of one thing. When everybody else was interested in many things, my fame, my success, my ministry, and maybe God. But Billy Graham, he was interested in one thing. It is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, which the God of grace has entrusted to me. And for that, I do not count my life as value, as precious to myself. That's exactly what the Apostle, uh, Apostle Paul is saying. My life is not even important for me as long as I can finish this course, share the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. But the question is, how do I get that mindset? How do I become the man and woman of one thing? That's the last question that I, I want to examine. The really interesting thing is, the Apostle Paul could have said, I am, I am going to finish the course. I don't count my life as precious to myself or of any value as long as I can share the gospel. But what does he say? He uses the term, he uses the phrase, the gospel of grace. You know what the grace is? It's not, I'm not talking about my sister's name. I'm talking about, you know, what is a grace? What is the gospel of grace? You know, Chicago, there's many churches, and there's one famous church called the Willow, Willow Creek Church. The Willow Creek Church is very well known, but there's another church in Chicago that is not as well known, but it's a very, very good church. It's called the Harvest Bible Church, uh, Harvest Bible Chapel. And, uh, you know, as a pastor, I served my church, Korean church, um, for six years. But every Saturday night, I would sneak into Harvest Bible Chapel so I can be fed too. So I would listen to the sermon. I would worship together with the Harvest Bible people. And, you know, I attended the worship service. One time, I was sitting in the back. I saw one gentleman sitting very front. There was one guy sitting very front, and this guy was pouring out his heart. There's one guy. He was just standing right in front. So different. He was, he, 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 so different from everybody else around him. He was pouring out his heart in worship. He's like, <gasps> he's worshiping like that. I was looking at him, and he, he actually was dressed pretty unique, too. He had the wife beaters. He had tattoos. His ears are pierced probably for, like, you know, I don't know what he did with it. And his nose pierced. And he's, like, his head's completely shaved. It has scars. And he's wearing baggy pants and chains. And he's worshiping zealously. I'm just watching him like, what is this picture? So after the worship, I actually had to go up to him. And I, I, I struck a little conversation with him. And I said, how are you? And he started a conversation. And throughout the conversation, I found something out. This guy 
had just come out from the prison. Uh, he murdered someone who was a drug addict and drug dealer, and he killed someone, murdered someone. He was taken into prison. And while he was in prison, he encountered God. He met Jesus. He became a Christian. He came out. And now he wants to start up his second life, a new start. And he's just so thankful about, you know, for the, for the grace that God has given him. Second chance in his life. And from that, I was sure of one thing at first. You know what that is? Forgiven much, therefore you love much. It's not the opposite. You love me much, and then I will forgive you much. It's, it's never like that. What is that? That's the religion. But the gospel says, the, grace, the gospel of grace says, you know what? While we're still sinners, I will forgive you much. And as you begin to realize the grace that you have, you have accepted, you have received already, you begin to love God, who has given you that grace while you're still sinners and the enemy of God. When you do that, you know what happens? You'll be able to run the race, join the journey, and go towards the ends of the earth, expecting to see Jesus Christ face to face on that day as he welcomes you into his arms. Um, I'm going to show you a little clip of, um, a, of uh, persecuted churches. And maybe this morning we want to just know what's really going on. Maybe it's a brief introduction of what's really, really out there. But it might be a, just a good reminder of what's going on. And these are the ways how people keep their faith. And maybe we can pray for them and we can pray for ourselves so we can actually join them in this journey. All right?